Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Ruben Camacho. I am the president of the UIC Federal Society chapter. Uh, the Federal Society as a whole is a group of conservative and libertarians interested in the current state of legal order. Uh, it is strong on the principles of free speech and open discussion, and that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Uh, the society seeks both to promote an awareness of these principles and to further application through its activities of free and open discussions. Today's topic, why did my law school drop its name and should it have? Uh, seeks to bring a discussion forward that I've been asked by a lot of students uh, regarding why we got rid of the name John Marshall. Uh, some parties argue on one side that a history of slave related issues was reason enough to remove a name like John Marshall from the school. Others argue that slaveholding or even pro-slavery jurisprudence over two centuries ago should not be sufficient as the man is being honored for his legal contributions to our legal history, not the negative aspects of his life. And then even others argue, why was the school named after him in the first place when he has no connection to Chicago or the school? So with these questions in mind, we have multiple speakers here to discuss the merits of all the points. And more importantly, the information about who John Marshall was and just the history behind it. Uh, I'm going to put, post the link for the attendance. Please make sure to fill that out because that's the only way I'll be able to send out gift cards towards the end as far as our raffle winners for Grow Up. Uh, and with this in mind, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, so first and foremost, we have Mr. Josh Blackman. Uh, Josh Blackman is a national thought leader on constitutional law and the United States Supreme Court. His work has been quoted uh, during two presidential impeachment trials. He has testified before Congress and advises federal and state lawmakers. Josh regularly appears on television, including NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox News, and the BBC. Josh is also a frequent guest on NPR and other uh, syndicated radio programs. He has published commentaries in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and leading national publications. Uh, since 2012, Josh has served as a professor at the South Texas College of Law in Houston. Josh is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Josh has authored three books, his latest, An Introduction to Constitutional Law, was a top five bestseller on Amazon. He has written more than five dozen law review articles and has been cited nearly a thousand times. Josh was selected by Forbes Magazine, 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy, and is the president of the Harlan Institute and founded Fantasy Scopes in its premier Supreme Court fantasy league. If you have any questions on that, feel free to ask me towards the end. Uh, we have Professor Stephen Schwinn. Uh, Professor Schwinn has earned his BA from Michigan State University and his JD from the American University of Washington College of Law. He previously taught at the University of Maryland School of Law and George Washington University Law School. Uh, he's co-founder and co-editor of the Constitutional Law Professor's blog. Professor Schwinn is the editor of the American Constitution Society Supreme Court Review, an annual publication reviewing cases and issues the Supreme Court. He regularly, uh, regularly writes for the ABA preview of the United States Supreme Court cases. He serves on the board of advisors for the Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the American Constitution Society and the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Public Education. Uh, we also have with us Professor William Ford. Uh, Professor Ford received his law degree from the University of Chicago in 2003, where he was the symposium editor for the University of Chicago Legal Forum and co-chair of the Infant Moot Court Competition. Uh, after law school, Professor Ford worked for the Los Angeles firm of Iro and Manella, and then returned to the University of Chicago Law School as a uh, Bigelow teaching fellow and a lecturer in law. Professor Ford came to UIC as a visiting professor in 2006, and joined the full-time faculty in 2007. He teaches computer and video game law, contracts one, constitutional theory, IP survey, and writing for publicity and protection of, protection of personality. Without further ado, I have an absolute pleasure to welcome Mr. Josh Blackman to our USC community, and I'll go ahead and let you get started, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, sorry we couldn't do this in person, but we couldn't quite make the logistics work out quite yet, but we'll be back to uh, normal hope soon. Um, so I'm in a bit of a weird spot here. I'm okay with taking John Marshall's name off the door, but perhaps for different reasons than some of the other people in this group. Um, I've long thought that Chief Justice Marshall was overrated. Um, I tell my students that every year, long before your current controversy began. I think that might be a good way to begin my talk, right? Um, why is it that John Marshall is so revered? And unfortunately, I blame law professors, people like me and Steve. Um, Law professors have this tendency to praise judges who are really smart and crafty and figure out creative ways 
of resolving cases that aren't always formalistically correct, but reach a good result. And I think that's John Marshall in a nutshell. Um, his most perhaps famous opinion of all time, Mario vs. Madison, um, had severe problems. First and foremost, Marshall should have recused, right? The entire basis of the case was that John Marshall failed to deliver a commission to William Marbury. Then Marbury sued to get that commission, and, Mar and Marshall didn't recuse. The entire case was an ethical travesty, right? He was the reason why the case arose, and he didn't recuse. This is not a man we should honor. Forget everything else. He, he, he screwed up as a judge, right? As a judge in the most famous case, right? But yet Marshall found a way to rule against President Jefferson without actually ordering Jefferson to do anything, thus apparently establishing this power of judicial review. Um, this is a flawed decision. I have come around to defend it in some regards. It's probably correct based on the arguments presented, but it's a flawed decision, right? But this image of John Marshall is built up over the course of a century because lawyers and law professors sort of worship this smart, politically savvy judge. Um, I don't worship him. I think he's overrated. The only other justice more overrated than Marshall is Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's very overrated. Uh, uh, I think Holmes and Marshall cut from the same cloth. And I think in many regards, <laughs> they might both be canceled one day. Um, but I have no love for John Marshall. Um, the second point I want to make is he has zero connection to your law school. I've looked into this. I read the report that you're, uh, you have the task force that came together. I read it. The reason, and, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong about this, the reason why they pick Marshall is purely an accident of timing. Apparently, your law school was founded, I think, around the turn of the 20th century, or I guess uh, to, to the 20th century. It was on the um, anniversary of when Marshall was appointed to the court, which was 1801 to 1901. And they said, ah, it'll be a good marketing move if we name ourselves after this famous judge who's about to get a centennial, it'd be good for business. I think that's the reason, as best as I can tell from my research. I mean, that's not a very good reason. Um, there's no contractual basis to keep them. You know, sometimes a donor will say, I give you X dollars if you name the school after my grandfather for so many years, right? That's fairly common. Uh, that didn't happen here. Uh, there were no covenants, you know, restrictive covenant that said, um, if you don't keep this name, we will, you have to forfeit money, right? As I understand it, the only restriction was basically within the university, which is now a public institution, that you would keep the name of the door for at least a couple of years. Um, if I had to guess, your dean was probably trying to sell the naming rights independent of John Marshall as a fundraising tool, right? Many law schools have sold their names to wealthy trial lawyers, usually, and other people, and they've made a boatload of money. And there is nothing, oh, actually, Pritzker's not a trial lawyer, but you get my idea, right? Um, and they make lots of money. So again, I don't have any actual objection to your law school, which I visited before. It's a very nice law school. Changing their name from John Marshall. It doesn't even have any uniqueness. There are about three or four other John Marshall law schools, which probably creates confusion. I think there are so many good policy reasons to drop the name that I feel almost guilty debating the other side, but I will. Uh, with that, with that, with that lovely, with that lovely windup. Now, I think we have to look at this from two perspectives, right? You have John Marshall, the judge, and then you have John Marshall, the man. And I think we you know we, we can put them back together again later because there probably is a linkage between the two of them. But I think we need to separate them at least at the outset. So first, let's talk about his judicial career. Um, again, I think he's overrated. I think his decision in Marbury was a, was a was a travesty. Um, he was still a judge for 30 something years and he wrote hundreds of opinions on almost every area of the law. And to this day, Marshall opinions are still cited. McCulloch v. Maryland, by Congress's implied powers, right? Gibbons versus Ogden about the scope of Congress's enumerated powers. Uh, you've probably all studied Barron v. Baltimore, which was a very important case saying the Bill of Rights doesn't limit state power. Um, uh, cases on the Dormant Commerce Clause, cases on the Contracts Clause, right? If there was an important issue of law in the early 20, I'm sorry, the early 18th century, um, odds are Marshall ruled upon it. 
um, at the time, as we know, there was slavery. And a significant number of cases involved slavery. Um, many of those cases went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the task force that uh, did, did this research counted in C. Preckner wrong about a dozen Marshall cases. I, I, I didn't get all of them, but I, I looked at most of them. Um, and these were cases in which the slaveholders prevailed and the cause of abolition um, was defeated. And the inference drawn is that Marshall consistently ruled against slavery. Now, I want you to look at this from two perspectives, right? Maybe one perspective is, well, maybe the law was actually in favor of slavery. Um, it's a difficult thought for lawsuits sort of grasp, but sometimes the law is an ass, to quote Dickens, right? Sometimes the law simply leads to an unfortunate result, right? In which case the remedy is to perhaps change the law or even amend the Constitution. Um, our Constitution was a flawed document from the outset. Um, it was understood to sanction slavery, right? And it took a civil war. And three amendments to sort of jettison that reading. So to the extent that Marshall is interpreting the Constitution, and he said the Constitution perhaps favored slavery, who was wrong? Was it Marshall wrong or perhaps the Constitution was wrong? Um, perhaps Marshall is interpreting common law cases. The common law didn't always favor the cause of freedom. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, there was some statutory law. The statutes may have been written by people who were pro-slavery. So when you say the decisions were pro-slavery, perhaps one we're looking at is maybe the law was pro-slavery and he was simply faithfully following the law. Now, I'm going to reverse what I just said and dump on Marshall a bit. He wasn't very good at following the law, right? When he, when he wanted to follow the law, um, he could. And when he wanted to ignore the law, like in Marbury, he did a thing. So, so if this was actually a principal judge, I would give him some slack. Right, that he was actually faithfully applying the law, but 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 maybe it's true that Marshall's personal views on slavery um, affected how he approached slave-related cases. Now, I'll flip it back one more side. I pulled up about ten of the cases, and they were all unanimous. Um, they were no, not nine zero. There weren't nine judges, but you know they were unanimous. There were no, there were no published dissents. Uh, the courts were predominantly covered by Southerners uh, because at the time most of the presidents were Southerners, uh, but there were some Northerners on the court. Perhaps most famous was Joseph Story. Joseph Story from Boston was not a slaveholder. Slavery had been abolished in Boston for many years. Um, yet Justice Story joined many of those decisions. And I don't mean to pick on Justice Story, but he was one of the most influential constitutional lawyers of his era. He was a professor at Harvard. He wrote um, these very famous commentaries in the Constitution. Justice Story also wrote a very influential case, one which you should have studied, but maybe you didn't. We all know about Dred Scott, but how many of you know about Prigg versus Pennsylvania? Right? Prigg, Steve might correct me, I think was actually more harmful to the cause of freedom than Dred Scott was. Prigg authorized the Fugitive Slave Act, right? This law allowed basically bounty hunters to travel across state lines and capture people they claim were slaves who often weren't even slaves, they were just mistaken identity, and drag them back down south. This was a federal law that I think was unconstitutional for many reasons. But just a story, a northerner who did not own slaves wrote this decision for the court, right? Story lined up with Roger Tawney in this case. In fact, Tawney went a bit further. But I use this data point to perhaps suggest a more basic point. To the extent that judges were ruling in favor of slavery, it may have been the law actually sanctioned slavery, which is why we needed a bloody civil war to sort of remedy that, to pass the 13th, the 14th, 15th Amendments, to um, uh, provide for the Reconstruction Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act, the uh, the Freedmen's Bureau Act, these legislations that sort of undid this, this sort of stain in our legal culture. All right. So that's the sort of legal aspect. Um, next, talking about the man. Um, I'll admit I learned a lot about Marshall preparing for your lecture. Um, I'd known some, but I'd know everything. And the extent of his slave ownership, I don't think was 
well known. In fact, I didn't know about it until I came to your to your school's uh, report. Um, he was worse than others, right? Um, even as a contemporary, he had far more strident views on slavery than, say, Washington and others. Um, so again, I don't have any grievance with sort of removing John Marshall from your building and chiseling his name off the granite through, I don't know if those granite, but you know, chiseling his name off the granite. Instead, I want to flag a different issue, right? What is the line that we all draw to decide whom we honor? Um, is slavery sui generis? That is a entity unto itself, a categorical imperative that we can't have anyone involved in slavery. Um, is it perhaps someone who was within the mainstream of slaveholding? Um, where exactly do we draw the line? And is the line only slavery? What other types of modern um, modern issues might render a person unworthy of recognition. Um, you know, law students hate slippery slope arguments, but unfortunately we have to sort of figure out what the slope is, whether it's sticky or not, right? If we say, well, we're just talking about Marshall, um, you know, forget John Marshall, forget Sarah Marshall too, right? Just forget about him, right? I'm okay getting rid of Marshall, but there are a lot of other people who are contemporaries to Marshall who are also slaveholders. I said Washington, Jefferson, right? Um, do we change the name of the state of Washington, right? It's a state, it's in the Northwest. It's, it's you know, it's a beautiful state, borders the Pacific, right? Do we change the name? I think Cascadia would be a nice name to want to change or Olympia maybe, right? Do we change the name of the state? Um, do we take down monuments? Or do we put up an explanatory placard on the Washington Jefferson Monuments explaining it? Right? Now, let me push a little bit further. There are a lot of judges in American history who have written decisions that are, you know, not so pleasant in contemporary law. Um, again, the decisions may uh, very well have been correct for the law at the time, right? Again, this is Dickens, but sometimes the law is an ass. Sometimes the law does lead to unjust results. Uh, I'll give you a few examples, which you may or may not know about. Um, Justice Holmes is usually praised and venerated. He was not a Confederate. In fact, he was quite the opposite. He fought for the Civil War for the Union. He was injured in battle several times. He was a war hero. Uh, I'm truly an American, a remarkable human being, all things considered. Um, but he was also kind of a social Darwinist. Um, he favored eugenics. Uh, maybe you don't know what eugenics is. I'll explain. Um, it's a belief that certain types of people uh, should not reproduce because they are corrupting the gene pool, sort of like idiocracy, right? That that if they're allowed to reproduce, they will destroy our culture. That there'll be too many mouths to feed. Thanos, right? You know, we need to we need to call the population. But instead of snapping your fingers, instead, they sterilize people. Uh, there was a case called Buck versus Bell from Virginia in the 1920s. Um, Virginia basically said, if we deem you an imbecile, we will sterilize you. Justice Holmes upheld it. And he didn't just upheld it. He upheld it enthusiastically. He had a very famous line. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. What does that mean? Well, Carrie Buck was an imbecile, her mother was an imbecile, and her daughter was an imbecile. That Three, that's enough. You got to cut off the bold line, right? It's one of the most callous phrases in American Supreme Court history. Um, I think if we're taking down the John Marshall, I think Holmes has got to go also. I, I mean, I, I would remove Holmes for other reasons, but I think he might be there. But these aren't just people like Holmes, people like Brandeis. Right, I'll give you an example. Uh a very famous case argued in the early 20th century is Mueller against Oregon. Um, this case was about whether there could be a minimum wage for women. Or was it maximum hours? Ugh, I think I screwed up. It, it was a law that protected women's labor rights. I might be messing up the facts a little bit. Um, 
The employer said, no, 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 women have a right to bargain for contracts as they wish. Um, Justice Brandeis, who was then an attorney in private practice, filed a very famous brief called the Brandeis Brief. We put all these facts saying why the state should be allowed to regulate labor. Okay, that might sound nice. But his argument was that women are inferior. They are weaker. And they need the protection of the state to survive. Um, I kid you not, his brief actually said that women are weaker. If they work too much, the uteruses will fall out, so we have to limit their hours. Brandeis, right? This guy's worshipped. He actually wrote that that women have more water in their blood than men do. I mean, it was nonsense even for the day, right? Just, but but these are things that are making some of the people on my Zoom window wince, right? Very often, legal arguments, even in the 20th century, seemed very different than they do today. I'll give you another example. Everyone knows the case of Plessy against Ferguson, which which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. Um, there was a famous dissent by Justice John Marshall Harlan, uh, who was a former slaveholder from Kentucky who reformed his ways and, and became a colonel in the Union Army. Um, a remarkable human being. Just he 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 transformed himself. He he realized the evil of slavery. And he he sort of redeemed himself and he he vigorously fought against African slavery with with his own, with his own blood in the war. Um, Justice Harlan dissented in the Plessy case, the lone dissenter, eight to one. And he said, we have a colorblind constitution, which for the time was, wow. I mean, people was actually saying that, right? That was a big deal. And then Harlan has this other part of the opinion that gets edited out of a lot of books. It's in my book, but maybe Steve has in his book too, I think, you know, so I'm talking about where Harlan says something like, well, black people are not different from us. They're the same, the same as us, right? They should be treated the same. But there's another class of people who should be treated differently, Chinese people. And he goes on this long rant about Chinese people cannot be assimilated, that they're loyal to their emperor, that they can never be part of the American body politic. So in the same opinion in which Harlan sort of praises equality for black Americans, he goes around and, 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 and just dumps on Chinese people saying that, oh, they're different, right? They, you know, they, they don't deserve the same rights. They're not really American as us, right? What I'm trying to get across is that the line we draw is significant. If we decide that, that Marshall is too far, okay, fine, get rid of him. I'm not going to defend him. I think he's, he should be gotten rid of a long time ago. But a lot of other justices who hold positions of, of uh, respect in our profession also have skeletons in their closet, right? Um the current members of the Supreme Court likely also fit there. I know there's a very proactive attempt uh, uh, to, to, to basically push Justice Scalia aside. Okay. I think I've said um, enough. Um, hopefully my position is clear. If not, I'm happy to answer some questions. But I'll turn it over to my good friends, uh, Steve and uh, Chris Ford, and we will um, uh, hopefully have some time for discussion later. Thank you all so much. Hey, Ruben, do you want me to pick it up? Okay, everybody, can you hear me okay? Audio's good? Okay, thanks. So um, that was fantastic. Ruben, thank you for organizing this. Um, you know, Ruben, I've told you, I've told you, Josh and Bill, I think the Federalist Society events are among the best that, um, that we do in terms of public education and engagement with these issues, constitutional debate, and just public learning about these issues. And I'm just so honored and pleased to be a part of this um, and to uh, to be with Josh Blackman, who I just adore. Aww. Josh and I have had, what, I don't, over the years, I'm not even sure how many opportunities we've had to, uh, to debate in Federalist forums, but the, it's a real treat, Josh. And so I'm so glad that you're able to be with Thank us. You, so thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, so uh, I want to pick up a little bit on some of the things that Josh started talking about, and then I want to move in the direction of why we made the change at USC Law School from John Marshall Law School. Talk a little bit about that and, um, and just kind of see where the conversation goes. I'll try to limit my comments and leave plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. 
So uh, I got to say, I'm right there with Josh in terms of Marshall being overrated. <laughs> and I agree about Marbury versus Madison. Um, I would add there were not only ethical issues all over that opinion, but there were doctrinal issues on that opinion as well. It's not at all obvious, for example, that Section 13 of the Judiciary Act authorized the Supreme Court to issue a mandamus on uh in its original jurisdiction. Uh, Section 13 could equally be read to authorize appellate jurisdiction, which would have made the entire issue a non-starter from the get-go. And so, um, you know, I mentioned that because, and you all, I hope, have studied this in constitutional law, but I mentioned that because Chief Justice Marshall is somebody who knows his way around the law and can get to the kind of result that he wants to get to even if the law and ethics might otherwise stand in his or somebody else's way, this is a guy who knows how to get it done. And, um, and that matters in terms of, uh, of his jurisprudence and at least one of the reasons why our committee recommended um, changing the names. I do want to, I want to just sort of respond to a couple of other things that Josh had mentioned. The print case and story, I totally agree about that as well. Um, there is a theory out there that that Story wrote Prigg in the way that he did, and that Marshall wrote McCulloch versus Maryland and some of some of these decisions that I'll mention here in a second, in order to create a robust and uh, strong federal government, so that the federal government could actually outlaw slavery and move in the direction of eradicating slavery. I, I'm not sure I'm fully there on that theory, but I mention it because you have a note that, that um, there is this idea that justices might write pro-slavery decisions toward a larger end, that is empowering a federal government to ultimately do something about slavery, and we can use our own judgments about whether that uh, whether that holds up to time and jurisprudence. Um, around the time of the decisions that we're going to talk about, they were these um, slavery decisions by the Marshall Court, they were all or mostly unanimous. That's exactly right. But remember, this was a time when the court was issuing unanimous decisions. We didn't see justices dissent or concur the way that they do today and add their own voices to a majority opinion. Um, some might say that that represents a kind of uh, going so far as saying that's a lack of collegiality on today's court. I'm not sure I'd go so far. I think it's just different justices trying to voice their own opinions. But in any event, it's not a trend that we saw in the early Supreme Court. And I think we ought to be clear about this. When Chief Justice Marshall was leaving the court, it was the Marshall Court. So even in those cases where Chief Justice Marshall wasn't writing the opinion, you did often have times, most often, have unanimity, and you had a Chief Justice who was really, you know, right there, if not directing the outcome, certainly concurring in the outcome. Um, with regard to the idea that we have a flawed constitution, again, I totally agree with Josh. This is becoming less of a debate than it is an, an agreement session. <laughs> but yeah, we've got a flawed constitution. There are several provisions in the constitution that we can point to that uh, protect slavery and put a thumb on the scale in favor of slavery in different ways in our political system that I think are deeply troubling. And a lot of scholars have done some outstanding work looking critically at those provisions. Um, but that's not exactly what Marshall was doing in his early jurisprudence around slavery. And again, I go back to his opinion in Marbury versus Madison, where he was clever enough to read Section 13 of the Judiciary Act as a grant of original jurisdiction and therefore unconstitutional, as opposed to a grant of appellate jurisdiction and therefore constitutional, thus establishing the idea of judicial review. Um, this is somebody who knows his way around the law, right, and can write an opinion to get where he wants to go. So with that in mind, let me just say a couple of beats about some of the decisions that he wrote. Uh, Josh is right. There were about a dozen, I think, 14 um, decisions that the Marshall Court ruled on with regard to um, black freedom in the United States. And I say it that way, black freedom, because in some instances, these were black individuals who were not slaves 
and had actually been adjudged to be not slaves when the case came before the Supreme Court. In other cases, they were cases of slaves that were seeking uh, their emancipation through the courts for one reason or another, most usually because their owners had taken them to Washington, D.C., which at the time was governed by Maryland and Virginia law for historical reasons that aren't really relevant to the discussion. But what we saw time and time again is a chief justice who managed to not only ignore state law, um, he knew it was there, he knew what it said, but time and time again rule contrary to state law that was governing the emancipation claims of these slaves. Um, there's one case in particular that I thought I'd uh, that I thought I'd talk about that I think illustrates a larger trend of seven decisions that Chief Justice Marshall wrote and 14 decisions that his court ruled on with regard to black freedom. So this is a case that's called Wood versus Davis, where you have an emancipation claim through the courts of an individual whose mother had previously been adjudged to be free in the state court system. Now, under law at the time, if your mother had been adjudged to be free, then you would have been free as well because you would have been born a free citizen and not a slave. And so this individual's case came before the Supreme Court. And Marshall here ruled on what I think we can fairly call a almost a kind of hyper technicality with regard to the claimants of the case that this individual, a young, a young boy, that he actually was a slave, despite the fact that the courts had previously ruled that his mother was not a slave. Now, I mention the case because it's fairly appalling on the face of it, but it also represents a larger trend of the Chief Justice during this period to um, take a kind of approach to these cases that's very different than the kind of approach that we saw, for example, of Arbery versus Madison and some of the other decisions that he wrote. So again, you know, we've got a judge who in non-slave cases is willing to read statutes sort of cleverly, carefully, creatively, broadly in a way to achieve the result that he wants to. But when it comes to black freedom cases, he's reading sort of hyper-technically, working his way around state law, working his way around established doctrine in a way that, um, that rejects these claims. And incidentally rejects them 100% of the time. Of the seven decisions that he wrote, every single one rejected the claim of black freedom by a slave, uh, former slave, or even a non-slave, uh, if you can imagine. But that wasn't the only line of opinions that he ruled on. He also ruled on a lot of opinions involving the illegal slave trade. So you might know one of the provisions in the Constitution allows Congress to regulate the slave trade after 1808, which is exactly what Congress did. It barred the African slave trade after 1808, made it illegal, which meant that uh, transporting uh, individuals from Africa and bringing them to the United States for the purpose of selling them into slavery was actually an illegal act. But nevertheless, a lot of people still did it. Um, Marshall ruled in a line of cases, uh, again, consistently in favor of the, um, the individuals who owned the slaves or against the putative slaves or both, depending on the case. And again, usually based on misreading the law, misapplying the law, or going to extraordinary lengths to, um, to kind of reach the result that he was uh, seeking. If you're interested in one of these cases, which I think may be the best representative of these, it's called the Antelope, um, after a, a slave trading ship, the Antelope, where Marshall uh, wholly ignores judicial precedent from the Supreme Court itself. It was a case that he didn't write, but nevertheless, he ought to have been aware of because he was on the court at the time that the case came down. And he apparently wholly ignored the holding in that case in order to keep some of the black Africans on the antelope ship enslaved, even while freeing some others. 
again, this kind of hyper-technical uh, reading in order to achieve a result. Now, I think we could have really interesting discussions about all of these cases and delve into them, but the point for this discussion is that our committee looked at some of this jurisprudence, in fact, this jurisprudence, and said, look, you know, if we're going to name ourselves after somebody, we're not going to name ourselves after a chief justice who seems to go to extraordinary lengths to reject black, uh, black people's claims of freedom or reject their claims of freedom and, um, and uh, reject criminal claims against slave traders after 1808. And moreover, and Josh touched on this as well, Chief Justice Marshall was a, um, it's kind of hard to describe how active he was in the slave trade in the United States himself. So consider this, he started with one slave that he received as a wedding gift from his father-in-law. Even saying that, I mean, sounds just so appalling by today's ears, as it should. But nevertheless, back in the day, that was the kind of thing that father-in-laws might do. And so he, he received one slave from his father-in-law. He ended up with as many as 200 slaves at various different properties he had throughout Virginia. Um, that doesn't happen by accident. That's somebody who is active in the slave trade. Other founding fathers, um, you know, inherited slaves, didn't release them or released them in their will, various different, you know, sort of permutations of that, which may be equally troubling, but what struck our committee is that you had this individual who was so active in the slave trade that he managed to go from a single slave to as many as 200 in uh, the period of his life. Now, the 200 number, Josh said he, would, he learned a little bit about this from reading our committee's report. I did too. And um, I learned about it because there's a scholar named Paul Finkelman who wrote a book who actually discovered this. So for years and years, up until basically up until Paul's book came out, the scholarly community had thought that Chief Justice Marshall owned a dozen, maybe 15 slaves, maybe as many as 60 by some counts. But um, what Finkelman uh, discovered is that he owned many, many more again, as many as 200. And he discovered this in kind of a, um, well, in a way that I think reveals how slipshod his, history can sometimes be. And I think this is a cautionary tale for all of us lawyers who are doing law and may also dabble in history. He was reading John Marshall's will. And in the will, uh, John Marshall wills 15 slaves uh, upon his death. Right. And so most scholars said, OK, well, we're going to take that as evidence that he had 15 slaves. But they didn't go on to read in his will that he made reference to scores of additional slaves that he had at other properties throughout Virginia. They just kind of ignored that. And so Finkelman caught that in his will and said, hey, I wonder if there's anything to that. You know, this guy obviously owned more than 15 slaves. I wonder how many more. So he sent a research assistant on the task. He did some genealogical research and discovered he owned as many as 200, which is pretty astonishing, again, starting from one. The way I think about the name change myself, um, this is always a hard issue. But the way I think about it is, um, you know, every day we wake up in the law school community and we have a new choice to retain the name of the law school or to change it. Right now, in fact, we don't have that choice every day, but in a way we kind of do. Weighing heavily against changing the name is just the history and tradition of having the name. But weighing heavily in favor of it could be a number of other factors, like, for example, newly discovered evidence that our namesake traded heavily in slaves or that he wrote what appeared to be contrived and opportunistic opinions, rejecting free claims by blacks uh, when he was on the Supreme Court. And so, you know, when we weigh all this out um, and weigh it also in the context of our integration with the UIC broader community, uh, such that this is a this is a good time to make a name change. It's a necessary time to make a name change because at the very least we're going to incorporate UIC into our name. 
and moreover, both UIC and, and uh, the UIC Law School, John Marshall, have a long, rich history of social justice, community engagement, inclusion and diversity. But we sort of put all that stuff together, in my mind, you know, on the day that we wake up and decide we're going to consider changing the name today, that weighs heavily in favor of considering a name change. And, you know, I recognize that people, we all are very complicated. And I think Josh is exactly right that other justices have skeletons in their closet themselves. And I don't propose that we stop honoring Chief Justice John Marshall for the significant contributions that he's made to our law and jurisprudence and to the Supreme Court. But um, I'm also not objecting to a name change for the reasons that the committee said. And so I think with that, I'm just going to stop and shut up, uh, hear what Bill has to say, and leave maybe a little bit of time for the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you, press board. Sorry. The there you are. Mic device was on mute. Um, I uh, I was saying in agreement with something that uh, Steve said at the beginning of his comments that there may not be a lot of disagreement here. Uh, I I could add that many of us expected that UIC would change the name anyway as soon as the contract allowed for it. And although I've never seen the contract, I have been told on many occasions that it allowed. UIC to change the name after five years. Prior to five years, it required going through these stages of approval. So this was going to happen anyway. And really the only question was whether we whether we do it now or um, whether it happens later. Uh, you know, Josh ran through a list of reasons why we might very well have changed the name. We could also add that over the 100 years of having the John Marshall name. We never really did much, as far as I know, to develop a connection with John Marshall beyond using his name as a mark. So that's our suggestive trademark. I think I put it in the suggestive category for those who took trademarks. Uh, but we didn't develop a substantive connection. I think, if I'm not mistaken, at one point before I came to the law school, there was a symposium on John Marshall, but that was not a regular event. And so we did nothing to establish ourselves as a center of study about the life or jurisprudence of John Marshall. Now, it's already pointed out that we don't have um, any connection here in Chicago to him. Um, there was a problem with consumer confusion that was very real. John Marshall Atlanta. There may be another school. Josh, you may have seen Yeah, Cle Cleveland before. Marshall. Cleveland Marshall in Cleveland. Okay. Well, especially with Atlanta, John Marshall, I know that we had consumer confusion problems. So when you throw all of this into the mix, it, it didn't really become all that difficult of a choice. Uh, it's not equivalent to, say, the Woodrow Wilson School's choice, or, or I don't know what will eventually be decided, but uh, should there ever be a change to the name of Washington Lee University, that would be a more difficult choice since Lee was attached to the university early on in its history. We simply didn't have that. Uh, so I don't know that I really have anything to disagree with. I, I guess if I had to, I, I'd quibble with something that uh, was said about Section 13 of the Judiciary Act, but that's probably a, a not really all that uh, helpful at this point. We're down to only 14 minutes here. I think we should open it up for questions and, and some additional discussion rather than have any repeat things that has already been said. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and see. Uh, we can either get into a little bit more discussion back and forth, or if anyone, anyone in the chat, if you guys have a question, feel free to unmute, post it in the chat, let us know. Uh, but any of the speakers are completely available for questions. Perhaps I, I, could, I could start. Um, do you think that the... Um, you know, I, I read through the their task report. It was pretty was pretty well done. Um, is this analysis limited to the so-called vestiges and badges of slavery, which is I think what the phrase was used in the report, or would it extend to other contemporary issues, uh, women's rights, abortion rights, 
uh, LGBT issues. Um, in other words, is slavery just a sort of categorical imperative of this issue that that is unlike any others, or are other issues that raise flags and you know today may also give rise and and where does this lead? That, that's always what I try to ask as law officer. Maybe Steve or, or Rob could could opine. Um, I mean, I've got my own opinion on that. I don't, I don't have any bright lines of where there's a stopping point, Josh, and I do agree with you. At some point, you've got to worry about, um, you know, who, how you're making decisions about honoring people and not. Um, for me, given the confluence of factors, dropping the John Marshall name at this particular time turned out to not, to, you know, to be well within my comfort zone, and so I didn't even have to ask that question. But I would count that, uh, I guess I would say that you know, certainly other uh, kinds of issues or problems could raise uh, similar concerns. Um, you know, at what point or how far, I, I guess I don't really know. But, um, but yeah, there are certainly other things could raise concerns for me. Well, there's a boulder up in Wisconsin that might provide an example of where else this could go. Steve, do you have a thought on the boulder in Wisconsin? University of Wisconsin, Madison? I think I think Steve stuck me in a rock and a hard place in that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, something like that. What's the boulder in Wisconsin, and how did I? Miss uh, this? So the boulder in Wisconsin was named after a racial slur that begins with the letter N. I'll just leave it there. No, hold uh, on, hold on. No, the boulder in Wisconsin was referred to yes. using the term a racial slur one time in a newspaper article in the 1920s. It was not a campus newspaper. It was the the Madison newspaper. I don't know the name. Um, so this term that is sometimes used for boulders, according to the articles I read was used in this article one time. Somehow, 100 years later, somebody discovered that this reference had been made in the 1920s, and then there was a campaign to remove the boulder from the campus. It was because it had some geological value and was used by students at the school as an object of study, it was relocated at a cost of, I think it was 50,000, it was tens of thousands of dollars, I don't remember the exact number, but the boulder was relocated to a place out of the way rather than being in some central position on campus. John McWhorter wrote a nice piece about it for the New York Times uh, in the past week or so, uh, but the story is now a few weeks old. So well, that's, that's you, extreme. You, Matt, I, I don't know how I managed to miss it. I, you know, I will say this. I, so I've been doing a lot of debates with the Federalist Society and others over the last couple of years about free speech on campus and the so-called campus cancel culture, which I think overlaps with our discussion today. And my consistent position has been, look, I, you know, what I worry about is when speech alienates people such that it prevents from their effective learning, or when speech alienates people from the political process or from the political engagement and dialogue itself. And so to the extent that speech or an object or a rock or whatever I mean, if that turns out to be distracting for a community, then I, I think that's problematic just, you know, from a practical educational standpoint, just as I think certain words or terms are, can be problematic in public discourse because they tend to alienate people from the public discourse and create a kind of inequality in the way that we're talking with each other. And, and that, that, that's just not productive in a democracy, uh, or in this case, in an educational institution. And so I don't want to hide on the rock. I don't know anything about it. But I guess I would say, consistent with my prior positions, um, if this stuff is distracting from the mission, I think it's worth thinking hard about whether we want to do something about it. Yeah, I will disagree after 52 minutes into the program. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that sometimes institutions exist to challenge and the purpose of an institution is not always to avoid conflict, but to perhaps permit it to happen and see what that yields. Um, working to eliminate conflict may actually disservice students, at least perhaps superficially, it helps them, 
but it may in other regards to service them and and, and make them ill prepared in other regards. So I, I don't I don't know that it's a purpose of a mission to avoid inconveniences or conflicts in that nature. Um, I think the the rock example is kind of insane. Uh, this was a newspaper article from decades earlier, we've been aware of, but the fact that someone knew that this was at one point called this, you have to spend an obscene amount of money to move it, strikes me as yielding to uh, a standard that 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 doesn't serve anyone well. It's I think that's a bad precedent as well. Well, Steve, uh, I'm again. I think now now with sediments, like we, we've got some disagreement going here because. What happens when the point at which something becomes alienating or distracting is, is a very low one? In other words, are you giving a veto to every individual in my class who's going to have a problem with some case or other reading I assign or some position that an instructor takes in class that I take in class? Um, the rock is an interesting example because the rock example is is one where I, I don't know I don't know what started this chain of events because they actually researched according to the article I read whether this slur had become like an unofficial name for the rock over time such that people continued to refer to it and the university people who investigated this could find no examples of this slur being used after the one article in the twenties. So that, this, this is a genuine example of something that mobilized people who claimed, as you suggest, to have been distracted, that this was causing harm on campus. Now, if something like this can cause harm, then, and, and you don't think it would be appropriate to ever say the demand is unreasonable, we're not going to do this, or I, mean, I don't want to characterize your position that way, but is it going in that direction where you don't want to tell somebody who makes an identity-based claim of harm, that the claim simply isn't compelling or persuasive. No, I, I, I agree with uh, both of you, the things that you, you most recently said in reaction to my comment. I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, you know, no, what I'm proposing is not a veto for any particular person who is offended by speech and you know i entirely agree that speech and uh engagement in um, higher education and in democracy ought to be controversial and we ought to push and test each other's ideas but when the purpose of the speech is simply to alienate it's not to advance an idea it's just to alienate people from the community of discourse whatever community that is that to me is not serving the purpose that uh, that we seek to serve in higher education or in democracy. It's not testing anybody's ideas. It's not pushing anybody to think harder. It's just alienating people. Now, where do you draw that line? I don't know. That's a much harder question. It's way above my pay grade. But um, but I think there must be a line at some point where some speech is wholly gratuitous simply for the point of alienating and therefore not contributing to a productive discourse or any of the objectives that we have in higher education or democracy. And I'm perfectly happy to, you know, say that speech is inappropriate. Are there any questions from the students? Please raise your hands. You have our undivided attention. Uh, if, they, if, if no one right now says when I, I did receive something in chat and um, uh, Professor Ford and Professor Schwinn, you might be able to either one, say that we shouldn't talk about this or two, be able to leave, leave some more information because I, I really don't know the details uh, I've just heard. But one of the students sent me a message asking uh, to ask if what you guys are discussing right now as far as the idea of students being offended or bothered or distracted by certain things, how that would play into, I guess, the situation that happened with a CIF Pro 2 exam from, I think it was last year or last semester, where, um, I, again, I don't know the whole details of the fact pattern, but I believe it used two exploded words in there. One was a derogatory term for black people, and one was, I believe, a derogatory term for women or sometimes dogs. I don't, I don't remember the exact thing, but basically, in short, I believe that was used on a prompt for an exam as something of like, oh, should someone get punished for this inside if you guys know more details, feel free, but that was a question I was asking. 
Steve, do you want to jump in on this? He does Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I definitely do not want to jump in on this. <laughs> uh, no, this is an issue. Many of you probably know. I'm sure Josh knows about it as well. Um, you know, and, and this is, uh, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend to know all the details, and even if I did, I, I wouldn't, could, wouldn't, and couldn't talk about them. Um, but I will say again, you know, I think how do you resolve a question like that? In my mind, well, is there an educational benefit to the speech that outweighs the uh, the cost of the speech? Is there an educational purpose uh, to that speech, or does the speech simply have the cause or effect or intent? to alienate students. And again, I don't know enough about the situation to make a judgment on that, so I'm not going to. But that that's how my uh, test would apply. Uh, I'll, I'll give a perhaps a different counterfactual. Um, I teach con law. I think Steve teaches con law. I think uh, Rob does as well. Uh, I've never taught criminal law before. Uh, I've never had the occasion to teach it. Um, I didn't do very well in law school either. Uh, but there's an area in criminal law that many professors simply will not teach, which is rape. Um, rapes still occur. Rapes are prosecuted. Uh, defense attorneys still have to defend against rapes, right? The, the, the fact that law professors aren't teaching it to avoid offense means entire generations of law students that we don't know about it. My law professor in law school skipped it. I only know I learned it in the SVU, right? I, I, I'm being mostly facetious, but I'd never learned this in law school. Um, if law school professors start cutting out certain topics from classes, or perhaps stop testing on certain topics, more to the hypothetical that, that Ruben asked, I think, again, students might be deserved. Um, in the past, I've given exams that talk about slavery. Um, not pleasant to write about, but it's a significant portion of any course in the 14th Amendment. I mean, that's, you know, maybe a quarter of the class. Um, did it make students feel uncomfortable during the exam? Probably. Yeah, I think they probably did. They, some have told me about it. In fact, um, did I think it was important that they learn about this and be able to demonstrate their knowledge on an exam on the 14th Amendment? Yeah, I did. Um, so again, I may, maybe I weigh my scales differently than Steve does, but I think sometimes in order to assess a person's uh, comprehension of information, they sometimes have to write up things that might be uncomfortable. I've had exams on abortion, on eugenics, on immigration. I, I tend to make my exams topical, which is maybe an error, but I've had exams on the travel ban back when that was an issue a couple of years ago. I had uh, questions on uh, migrant, uh, uh, unaccompanied migrants. You know, I, I've done um, <laughs> whatever the issue of the day is, I pride an exam question on it. Um, and I try to tell my students that if you become a lawyer and you get a client who walks in your door, you might have to take a case that you don't like. Now, again, if you don't want to do criminal law, go become a tax lawyer, right? There's nothing requiring to be a criminal attorney. But if you do criminal law, you might have a rape prosecution. You might have a rape defense, right? You might have someone who's accused of a hate crime, and you might have to defend that person who engages in some, some, some egregious conduct, right? There was a time the American Civil Liberties Union would defend people uh, marching in a Klan rally and skinheads marching through Skokie, not too far from where you guys are. Um, so may, maybe I, I, I balance my skills a little bit differently, but I err on the side of teaching and, and discussing. Uh, now, I would not put a slur in my exam. I think that's just stupid. It was not, it was not well thought out. I, I actually don't know the professor, so I don't have any objection to saying that this was not a smart move. But I think you could have tested that same material without using those words. Maybe you couldn't. Maybe, maybe the setup was you had to know that specific word to understand the sort of criminal intent. So maybe that was required. I wasn't in the class, so I can't judge. But I just, just to be clear on the facts here, though, the two words in question were not written out. They were redacted in the question itself. Uh, oh, I thought so, they were. Right, they, oh, words, they weren't written out. Oh. In other words. Oh come on. <laughs> and underscore, underscore. Oh, oh, I thought I thought you wrote out the words. Okay, never mind then. And then I mean, you wrote out the time you, here, but you, you can fill in the blanks. Yeah. A lot of national coverage. Yeah, I misremembered. Um, I'm sorry. You can, you can read a lot of the debate here, but just to be clear on the facts, uh, the, and some people argue you shouldn't redact, right? And there's an article. Yeah. Eugene. You know, from, uh, uh, I think it's Eugene Bullock and uh, Randall Kennedy, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you shouldn't redact, but it, the word was redacted. You could tell what was meant, but it's redacted. Yeah. 
Randy Barnett and I, we have a con law case book. And this year we actually added the Brandenburg case. It was in the book before. And we had a very lengthy discussion. Do we redact? And we eventually put stars, but, you know, N star, 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 R. And we decided after a very long discussion that we would do that. But it was it, we, we gave it a lot of consideration. Uh, so it's just in a footnote. Most students don't read the footnotes, but it's there. If you actually, if you actually read the footnote of Brandenburg, the court actually quotes the speech that was given by the Klansman. So we, we redacted. We didn't have to, but we we considered a lot of things. We decided that the case was still understandable. We got the point across with those words. And we could have made the footnote altogether. We didn't want to do that. Let me just jump in and say that I, I actually think Josh and I on this point are not that far apart. <laughs> Worst and, debate ever. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, that it would be a mistake to use a racial slur on an exam unless it has some purpose in the exam, right? That's exactly my standard. It would be a mistake to use this language unless it serves an educational purpose or unless it serves a, uh, a pedagogical purpose that um, that outweighs the alienating uh, cost that it comes with. Uh, and I would never, you know, I totally agree about teaching things like abortion or sexual assault and criminal procedure. I think those things are essential to our students. How we do it is a different question, but, um, but certainly those are areas of practice today that our students need to be educated in, and I would never take those out of the curriculum. Steve, would you have said Tam Gorsuch turns 54? Oh, I, 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 I do. I, I t yes, I do, and I talk about it. Yeah. This is, you're talking about the slants decision, right? I, I am, yeah. Uh, is it redacted in the book you use? It's not. Uh, well, funny you should ask. Uh, I'm doing my own material this semester, and so I've got to make a decision about whether to redact it or not. Yeah, if you don't know, this was a case... Uh, called Metal V. Tam, which involved an Asian American rock band called The Slants. I actually once had an Asian student ask me, why do you say The Slants, but you skip other racial slurs? I didn't have a terribly good answer for him. I didn't have a terribly good answer for him. I, I think the answer is the N-word has a unique place in American history that The Slants does. It was a phrase which I never really thought about until this band came around, but my answer I don't think was was terribly good. Well, and the whole point to it, I mean, the, I, I think it, it raised an interesting debate about reappropriation of, uh, of, racial, um, of racial labels that, uh, that I think is an interesting and hard question that is worth talking to students about, quite frankly. Okay, I think we're out of time. I don't want any people have to get going. So, uh, Ruben, back to you. Uh, well, yeah, if anyone uh, obviously has a class or anything, I know some people do, and I don't know if uh, you guys lost track of time, but it is uh, five after six, so if any of you have to go, feel free. Um, if the three of you are comfortable hanging around for a few minutes just in case there are any more questions, uh, I think I did get one or two more in the chat, but um, it it is also up to you guys if you guys have to take off. So let's do one more question, and we'll call it a night, okay? Uh, yeah, so the, the, one of the, the other question I got right here in the chat was first thanking uh, the speakers, and then it says... Um, so I realized when I was in, being introduced to law schools and considering different schools and some con law readings, I kept hearing about Chief, Chief Justice John Marshall, and why one reason why I decided to go to John, uh, John Marshall. Despite the removal of the name change from the school's title, what are some other ways that we could still give homage to Marshall's influence without honoring the negative aspects? Uh, ask John Roberts. I don't know. I, again, I, 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 I think it's hard to go through a first year comma class without giving homage to Marshall. Probably half the cases in the first few weeks are his. Um, so I think, you know, read them, study them, but also be critical of him because I think he's sort of overrated. Sorry, not a good answer, but I, I think he gets far too much attention. I, I, I don't think he deserves it. Well, nothing prevents another symposium, including a symposium that could be called Is John Marshall Overrated? I would speak at that one. The answer is yes. <laughs> or or <laughs> who is the most overrated justice? Yeah. I guess I got another topic to put together for later, huh? Awesome. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. This was lovely. Uh, I hope I can come visit you guys in person at some point, whatever the hell your name of the school is. I don't even know anymore. UIC, whatever. Sounds like... <laughs> It's a funny acronym, UIC. But anyway, uh, we'll come visit at some point. Thank you so much. Recording stopped. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blackman, Mr. Professor Schwinn, Professor Ford, thank you very much. And everyone who is still here, thank you guys for, for showing up. Uh, I'll be sending an email out soon that has information for our next upcoming stuff. And if uh, if you are one of the people in the raffle, you'll get an email directly from me. 
Okay, take care, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.